Hola pues, and welcome to Context Free, where we talk about programming languages. Today I want to talk about nested expressions, function call syntax, and parentheses, square brackets, curly braces, and more. Our primary example for today is working with RGB and named colors, and we're going to start in TypeScript. So here we have our structural type named RGB, and a convenience function for making one as well. In case we want some shading, we have a function to darken a color, and we have a short list of named colors that could represent a much longer list. In our main function, we make a list of red, yellow, and blue, convert them all to RGBs, and then get darkened versions of each. And we print out the original name, the RGB, and the darkened version in a row. Let's see what it does. And there we have it. Red, the RGB, and the darkened version, along with yellow and blue. As is common in many mainstream languages, or some mathematical notation, our arguments look like a tuple, in this case a triple, attached to the back of a function name. But for data indexing, whether by numbers or by names, we use square brackets. Curly braces are used for creating data with named fields or for code blocks, and angle brackets for type arguments or parameters. Like curly braces, square brackets can also be used for creating data. Now I think square brackets for indexing makes an interesting question, because in a sense, hash tables and arrays really are like functions. You give it an input, which is an index, and you get a value out. Depending on the language, they might be mutable, so it's sort of like self-modifying code. And we tend to think of square brackets as accessing data rather than performing a computation. But in the end, array access, in a sense, is a function call. So let's look at Scala to see a bit more of this notion. Here we have our data type, our darkened function, our named color table, our list of names, convert to RGBs, darkened versions, and print them out. And since this is Scala 3, or Dotty, I can use top-level functions. Let's see how it does. And we get what we expect. Red, yellow, blue with the various RGBs. But note here that in Scala, instead of angle brackets for type arguments, we use square brackets. Although Scala would have inferred the string argument in this case. And instead of making a special syntax for data lookup, you give your indices into arrays or whatnot using parentheses, which makes it look like a standard function call. This has an interesting effect for things like map. Back here in TypeScript, when I called it, I made an anonymous function, or lambda expression here, that receives parameter name and then does a square bracket lookup on it. I could have done something similar in Scala, but there's no need for it because named colors already acts like a function. So I can just map directly through my map object. Note also the lack of curly braces or whatnot in my map creation. Instead, it just looks like a function call. On the idea of array access via parentheses, let's take a look at C++. My example in C++ is not the same as the other languages because I want to emphasize different things, in particular, multidimensional arrays. So whether C or C++, I can create multidimensional arrays like this. Here I have two rows, one of 0, 1, and the second of 2, 3, so sort of a 2 by 2 matrix or grid, and I could incorrectly try to output the element at 1, 1 like this. I might think I'm getting the value 3 out of here. There's my row at index 1 and my column at index 1. But this is not the right way to do it in C or C++. I could also make a custom grid type with operator overloading for multidimensional access. But in this case, I'm using parentheses. And we'll look at this in a moment. Let's run this program first. For my latter case, with my custom lookup operator, I get what I expected, which is 3. Row 1, column 1. But for my first case, I get a memory address. If I really wanted to get the correct element, I would have to do a pair of indexing operations like this. Now I have three in both cases. So what does one comma one mean here? And something that can help us with this is C++20. So let's try it out. Now we get a warning. Top level comma expression in array subscript is deprecated. In C++20, they've decided that it might be worth diverting from traditional C in this regard. What it really sees is this comma operator. And the comma operator in C can take any number of expressions and evaluate them all, but the value of the overall expression is the last one. So this all turns out to be just one. So we're getting the address of row one. And by putting my comma operator into explicit parentheses, it makes my meaning clearer, and C++20 doesn't complain at me anymore. This is also why you can't have multi-parameter square bracket operators. Operator square brackets must have exactly one argument and which is also why linear algebra or matrix libraries in C++ pretty much always rely on the function call operator instead. Though as we saw in Scala, you might choose to have this be the way your language works in the first place. 
MATLAB and Fortran before Scala are examples of other languages that have also chosen this syntax. And finally, of course, also in C++, sometimes use function calls instead of operator overloading in the first place. Let's get back to our original example with Ruby. Here's our data type, our darkened function, our named color table, then our names, RGBs, darkened versions, and our print loop. Let's see how it does. And here we have our color names, our RGBs, and our darkened versions. Our common function calls in Ruby look the same as in other mainstream languages. We also have square brackets for lists and curly braces for named data. But our anonymous function parameters come wrapped in pipes. This is possibly derived from Smalltalk syntax. But one of the fun things about Ruby is you don't have to use parentheses when you call functions. Though a common style guide suggests that you don't go crazy with this. So for example, put s or other common cases usually just leave the parentheses out. But if I wanted to do the same with my RGB new calls, I might find some trouble. Because at this point, the comma becomes ambiguous. I would have to wrap it in parentheses, which gives me back to working again. And so because of the overall complexity, usually parentheses list function calls are only used in particular cases in Ruby. Though there are plenty of other languages that use parentheses differently for their function calls. Let's start with bash. Now because bash is sufficiently different from other languages here, I didn't implement things quite the same way, but I got close. There's no data type to define, but I do have a darkened function, a named color table, an array of names, and a loop to print things out. Here in Bash, like most of the languages we've looked at so far, we use square brackets for indexing. But we don't use square brackets or curly braces for making our data. And our function call to print, like in Ruby, doesn't require parentheses. If I had to type out parentheses and commas when working from a terminal, I might get a little bit angry at the overhead. However, when I want to do subshells, I am likely to wrap things in parentheses, but on the outside, let's run this and see how it does. And we get what we expect. Now I could go crazy, and wrap some of my command calls in subshells, in this case with no effect other than creating a useless subprocess, but it helps to emphasize how grouping usually works in bash or other similar shells. And if we generalize this across the board, we get to the Lisp languages. In this case, we have racket, which is a scheme, which is a Lisp. And everything here is nested parentheses. Let's find our way around. Here we have our data type, our darkened function, our named colors map, and then our names, RGBs of those, darkened versions of those, and our print loop. And we see here that every level of our syntax tree is wrapped in parentheses, except where it isn't. And I'll get to that in a moment, but let's run it first. We get our red, yellow, blue, and our RGB values. Now the reason why I have square brackets here in my racket program is because I can. To be more specific, curly braces, square brackets, and parens are interchangeable in racket. I could say I want curly braces around my definition here. And I crack my hash in square brackets. And the program acts the same. But more commonly in Racket, you use particular types of brackets in particular situations by convention. And in any case, having alternating bracket styles might make it easier to tell what goes with what. For me, I don't often use Lisp. So when I see a bunch of nested parentheses, the lack of syntactic diversity makes it harder for me to get my bearings. Sort of like if I see a flock of birds, I don't know who's who, though I'm sure they know each other. And what I hear from people who use Lisp a lot is that they don't really see the parentheses, they just see the program structure. But in case we want help beyond a variety of bracket styles, like Racket gives us, another trick we can use is colorizing our brackets. And this might possibly be useful for some people in languages beyond Lisp, depending on what works for you. So here we can see these gold parents go together, or the blues versus the magentas up here. So this might be useful for some people, and your mileage may vary. But in terms of the variety of brackets, curly, square, or round, let's look at another Lisp, in this case, Clojure. Unlike most Lisps, Clojure actually has different semantics for the different types of brackets. Beyond the common case of parentheses, square brackets are for vectors, and curly braces are for maps. So instead of the conventions of racket, there's required uses in Clojure. But one of the net effects is that you get a variety of bracket styles, which again, might help you in interpreting meaning from the variety. Let's run this program while we have it up. And it gives us what we expect. And the structure here is approximately the same as our previous programs. And it's also worth pointing out that different kinds of brackets are used in languages outside of programming as well. For example, in math, sometimes we use parentheses, square brackets, and curly braces, the same as in racket, just for distinction. This can also apply to everyday language, like in English style guides, such as MLA or APA. MLA says we should alternate between parentheses and brackets when nesting. It also suggests alternating between single and double quotes. 
And interesting to think about how in languages like Python and JavaScript, single quotes and double quotes have the same meaning, but just serve for convenient nesting, whereas other languages had different meanings for single and double quotes. The APA style guide also suggests alternating when nesting, but beyond that they say, don't use brackets if you can get away with an alternative. So here they say, please use commas instead of square brackets. So sometimes the style guide is, when nesting brackets, please don't. And we see this attitude to some extent in Haskell. To get our bearings, here we have our data type, a darken function which I split apart for fun, the named colors map, and then a main where we have a list of names, the RGBs, the darkened versions, and our print loop. Let's run this. And we get our names and our RGBs. Now we see here in Haskell that we call functions with just the name and then arguments following without commas, like we saw in our lisps. And even with infix operators, we can wrap our sub-expressions in parentheses also. But there are a lot of tricks in Haskell to avoid always nesting your expressions in parentheses. So for example, down here in put Sterlin, I have this dollar sign operator. I could have said this instead. And in fact, if I wanted to, I could wrap put Sterlin in parentheses or even my for loop. And it would all act the same. If I did this all over the place, it would look a lot like Lisp again. Except again that the common style in Haskell is, please don't. Sort of like our APA style guide in English. Anyway, there's lots more here that we could talk about, but I hope this has been fun. Maybe we can delve deeper into function calls, tuples, and so on in the future. If you like the video, be sure to subscribe. Ciao ustedes.